Our nation is in crisis right now. We saw the horror of it last Wednesday at the Capitol during the siege by insurgents. We saw the violence, we saw the death, we saw the ugliness. And now we are being warned that more violence is imminent, not just at the Capitol, but in the streets of Washington and at every state capitol. We are in a crisis. I think we think it's a political crisis and we act like it, but let me tell you, it's not a political crisis primarily. It is a spiritual crisis and we need to act like it is and we need to address it from that perspective. My heart hurts deeply for our broken nation. My heart hurts deeply for the polarization that is all around us. My heart hurts deeply because I'm not sure what's going to happen. In the midst of this, as people of faith, as disciples of Christ, we have two main tasks. The first is found in Second Chronicles, the seventh chapter. If my people who belong to me will humbly pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Our first job is confession and repentance. As a nation for how we are treating each other, as a nation for what we have allowed to happen, and as individuals, as we have allowed our disagreements to turn into hate and demonization. We always start with confession and repentance. It gets us in the right place with God. It changes our behavior. And right now, it is the foundational hope of our nation. The second thing we do is a unique task we have as disciples of Jesus Christ. It's what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. So then, from this point on, we won't recognize people by human standards. Even though we used to know Christ by human standards, that isn't how we know him now. So then, if anyone is in Christ, that person is part of the new creation. The old things have gone away, and look, new things have arised. All of these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ by not counting people's sins against them. He has trusted us with this message of reconciliation. Quite simply, if you love Jesus, if you follow Jesus, if he is your Lord and Savior, if you are his disciple, you live differently because you see everything differently. You are a part of a new creation. The old is being swept out. The new is coming in. And right now in this tumultuous time, that means you don't just take sides. You don't just demonize the other, and neither do I. We walk into the middle of the muck and the mess as reconcilers. It's hard work, it's messy, it's risky. But we see things differently, we understand things differently, we do things differently because of Christ. In the coming days, the future of our country will be written in many ways. And our work, as the people called Methodist in Arkansas, is to be on our knees praying and confessing and repenting and to wade into the middle, in the midst of the polarization, to bring reconciliation. I've been with you over eight years now, and I know your character, and I know your heart, and I know your faith, and every time you pray, and every time you seek reconciliation, you are 
giving a glorious witness to the Lord. And you are planting seeds of hope. Pray with me. Lord, we give you thanks for the great reconciling your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We confess our own sin in how we view others and treat others. We confess our nation's failings in so many ways. And we seek your forgiveness, and we seek to live in a new way. So fill us with just the grace we need at just the time we need it and just the way we need it, that we will be able to be reconcilers for Christ in a polarized and broken nation. We know that the coming days will be tense. We know there are threats of violence. We're not sure what's going to happen. But we know you, and we give you thanks that you are still God, Jesus is still Lord, and the Holy Spirit is still the Holy Spirit in all things, at all times. Amen and amen.
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. 
Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And this is the word of God for the people of God. And thanks be to God. I have a couple of these things. First of all, I've made some notes today, so I'll be referring to those. Also, I'm back in my gray shirt. I wanted to do that especially today because, first of all, I like gray. But also, I feel kind of gray today. I did something today that you hardly ever hear of. I sat down and I wrote a friend a letter. And yes, longhand, cursive and everything. And as I was writing that letter, I was thinking about the things I wanted to, to tell him in this letter. And I was thinking about just the events of this past week. And uh, I got to thinking about how this past week has been so, so shocking to us, actually the past two weeks. And uh, the things that we've seen, the things that have been going on, and it really made me kind of gray, you know? And so I thought wearing a gray shirt today would be appropriate, matching my mood. Last week, we saw many things happening, and uh, one of the things we saw during the terrorist attack on our Capitol building, we saw the Confederate flag being marched through the halls of that hallowed building. First time it had ever been in there. And I thought about that. I saw those crossed bars on that flag, and I realized that we are at a crossroads. Now, of course, we're at a crossroads in our nation. We are to the point where we have to decide, are we going to be ruled by violence and fear, or are we going to be ruled by justice under the rule of law. We have to decide what that will be for us, each and every one of us. And, you know, the way we, what we decide now will affect the future for years to come. And then I thought about our Christian lives, too. You know, we have just uh, observed Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, and we have come to this point after Jesus' baptism where the ministry of Jesus is beginning and where he's calling disciples in the question, the crossroads that those disciples find themselves at is what will they answer? When Jesus says, follow me, will they go? Or will they stay? That's the same crossroads we're at in our faith, in, in our Christian lives. In fact, every day we're at that crossroads. Today, will I live for Jesus or will I live for me? Will I serve my fellow human beings or will I serve myself and look out for my own best interest? And we have gotten so selfish in this world that very few people think of others before they think of themselves. Yet Jesus calls us to do just that. So it's a crossroads. Each day, who will I serve? And as we think of that, I also thought about this idea that, you know, not everybody responds in the same way. Not everybody sees Jesus or experiences Jesus in the same way. Notice in that text that we read, there were many names used for Jesus. Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. You know, the one of whom Moses and the prophets spoke of. 
Uh, Jesus calls himself a ladder, referring back to Jacob's ladder. A ladder that bridges the gap between heaven and earth. And what I get out of that is that many people experience Jesus in different ways. And because of that, many of them respond to him in different ways. Does that mean that one way is better than another? Does that mean that your way is better than mine? No, it doesn't. It means that diversity among the body of faith is okay. You see, I've experienced this idea of, of terrorism before, but it hasn't been so violent. In my own church, in our denomination, people threaten each other with division. In fact, there are many plans out there. I, I've seen them pass around on the internet. But don't pay attention to that stuff. Nothing's decided yet. But it's still the same idea of wanting everybody to think alike and look alike and respond to Jesus alike. And Jesus never demanded that. Jesus recognized that people would experience him where they were. What they're, under the circumstances, they found themselves, their worldview. And our worldviews aren't all the same. It's the same thing with our country. We don't all agree, but we all need to get along and respect differences. That's a hard thing to do. We often, we want people to be like us, to think like us, to act like us. I had a professor in college. His favorite, his favorite saying was, let every flower bloom. Let every flower bloom. And you know, flowers are pretty. But we're not all roses. And we're not all dandelions. Some of us, I'm afraid to say, are just grass. You know, we improve the looks of things, but sometimes we get a little out of hand. And things start looking pretty bad. But let us all grow together and produce that beautiful picture that is God's intention and God's work. Paul tells the early churches, uh, he tells them to be united. To be united in love and in purpose. That doesn't mean to be united in every opinion that they have, but to be united in love. To love each other. To love everybody. Even those who think differently from us. Why is that so hard to do? Why is it that People in the country, people in the church, people in the world demand that everybody think like they do. When in reality, that is impossible. There's no way that we can all be alike. So today, I want to mention and have you think about that crossroads that we are at every day of our lives. Especially now. It comes so it becomes so clear when we are in this tumultuous time. Which way will you go? When you get to that crossroads, which way will you, will you turn? And will that response that you make, will that demonstrate your faith? Or will it demonstrate something else? And what about as a church? As we stand at a crossroads, Whichever way we turn will demonstrate something about us. Not right and wrong. It'll demonstrate something about us. You know, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what it holds for our world, for our country, for our church. There's no way of knowing what it holds for those things and for us. But I do know that as the future unfolds before us, as we go on to live in it and to live with it, it's going to be interesting. And we will have decisions to make every day. And as we make those decisions and as we shape our world and as we shape our church, we will learn one thing. And that's what kind of people we are. Are we good people? 
Are we Christian people? Do we give everything to God? Or do we try to do it all alone? And think only of ourselves? Let us pray. Almighty God, these are difficult times. Lord, we struggle so much. We have a pandemic that we're living in. Lord, that yes, there is a vaccine that's coming out, but it's not coming out as quickly as we expected. And Lord, we don't know just how effective it's going to be uh, once it is uh, out and how many folks are going to take it. We don't know these things. We can only leave that up to you. And Lord, as we look at the turmoil within our nation, they, the, the people that are on extreme, extreme sides of the fence. Lord, we have to look to you. What can we do, Lord, to mend the gaps that are between us? What can we do, Lord, to bridge those gaps? We, we hear Jesus referring to himself as that ladder that bridges the gap between heaven and earth. Perhaps we can have Jesus bridge the gap between us. That's such a wonderful thought. But it's so difficult to bring about. So Lord, we pray today that you'll look at everything about us. Look at our relationship with our world, with our country, with each other. Lord, help, help us to mend those relationships, to reconcile those relationships. Lord, just as you have given up yourself to reconcile our lives to you. Lord, help us to be vessels of that reconciliation. Lord, not division, not anger, but of love and justice. Lord, this we pray in the name of Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.